Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, well, you know a couple things. One, we have a ton of live events for classrooms, over 50 live events by the time September will be all said and done. Uh, if you do want to check out more of those events, you can head to exploringbytheseat.com, and under the live lessons, as well as the special events section, you can find all of the amazing live events we have with scientists and explorers from all over the world this month. You'll also know that one of our big themes this month is ocean plastics. We've been talking to scientists and researchers and um, artists and explorers who are documenting the problem, researching it, and of course, looking for solutions to this challenging global issue. Today's event is gonna be a great one. We're gonna go live to Florida in the United States, and we're gonna spend a little time with Elitza Germanoff. So she is a marine biologist, and her focus is on saving large ocean creatures called megafauna from extinction. So besides learning about their lives, uh, she's particularly interested in how mantas and whale sharks may be harmed by ingesting small pieces of plastic called microplastic. So she's completed her PhD uh, in Western Australia, and she's hoping that she'll be able to inspire people of all ages to consider how we can better protect our marine environment, loving and caring for those creatures found within. So I'm going to bring Ellie in live with us right now. Hey, Ellie, how are you doing today? Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me back. It is great to have you back. I, I feel like every September we get to spend some time together and dive into the world of marine megafauna. So uh, obviously a huge thanks for, for being so dedicated to sharing that message with, with students everywhere. My pleasure. All right. Well, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. We've got classrooms joining us from across North America, uh, including Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Uh, we'll do a little mini Kahoot quiz. Uh, after you share a little presentation with us, and then we'll we'll rock a little Q and A action. Great. Okay. All right. So, um, has can everyone see my screen? Yeah, it's loading up, and we just need to go full screen. I think we're ready to go. All right. And how's it looking now? Perfect. Great. Um, all right. So thanks so much for the intro, Joe. Um, so yeah, my name is Elitza Germanoff, but most people call me Ellie. And I am, oh, sorry about that. I was just trying to hide something. I am a, a senior scientist with the Marine Megafauna Foundation, um, and we study large ocean giants. So I started off my scientific journey as a biochemist. Um, and then I picked up scuba diving and then decided to combine my love of um, figuring out how our bodies work and uh, the environment um, into a conservation biology um, focus. Um, so that's been my, my career for the last 10 years. Um, and um, that's been in partnership with the Marine Megafauna Foundation, uh, my university uh, in Western Australia, Murdoch University, and a university in Indonesia called Udayana University. So I am just one of uh, many passionate and dedicated uh, people working with the Marine Megafauna Foundation um, and with the mission of saving ocean giants from extinction. So these are just a few of the, of the people that are part of our team and the team is always growing. So I'm always having to update this slide. Um, and what brings us all together is our love for large ocean giants. So what we have here is a picture of the world's um, largest marine animals. And we happen to focus on studying uh, two of those. So uh, we've got the um, largest ray, um, the manta ray, and also the largest shark, um, and also the largest fish, um, and that's the whale shark. So uh, one thing, so you'll see these guys um, very well represented in our logo. Um, so one thing that ha these two uh, large ocean giants have in common, besides for their large size status, 
is that they are both uh, filter feeders. They are um, sieving the water for a living. They get their food by filtering the water. And what they're looking for is tiny microscopic creatures called plankton, so things like copepods and krill um, that float in on the ocean currents and aggregate in different parts of the marine environment. And normally where you see the food is where you'll find these um, large gentle giants. Um, uh, because of their large size, um, they need to um, eat quite a lot to uh, meet their energy demands. So for manta rays, we know that um, it's estimated that they take in about 90 cubic meters of water per hour. And for whale sharks, it's a whopping 300 cubic meters per hour. Now, if you're not very familiar with the measurement of cubic meters, here's a little visual. So you know the blue bottles that you might have around your school um, or um, at, at your home. So if you take um, those and multiply, take a pile of those and multiply it by 90, this is how much water manta rays are filtering in um, per hour. So 90 tons, and for whale sharks, it's uh, 300 tons of water. All right, and they have a couple of different adaptations so that they can make the most out of uh, getting the plankton out of the water. So for manta rays, we most commonly see them surface feeding, um, very just, just right beneath the surface where a lot of the zooplankton floats in. And then you'll see their mouths wide open. They've got their big fins, uh, big funnels ready to uh, scoop up uh, whatever might be there. Uh, in some places, we start to see other behavior called barrel rolling, and this is a great way to take advantage of a big um, uh, congregated uh, or concentrated uh, patch of plankton, because when plankton comes in, it's not, it's not uniform. Um, sometimes it's very, very patchy. So instead of the manta having to swim back and forward, you can just do a somersault and get those uh, uh, plankton snacks. And we also see bottom feeding in some locations where the mantas actually just get really down low and take advantage of eating some of the plankton um, that hides in, um, uh, in the sea bottom. And for the whale sharks, we see um, kind of, uh, we see this uh, swimming with the mouth open behavior as well. But the difference for them is they're also actually also actively gulping it in um, as well. And uh, here's another interesting video of them vertically feeding, where they basically uh, suction right up from the surface. So really take anything that's floating uh, at the surface right into their mouths. Um, so, uh, manta rays um, and whale sharks, well, they love uh, warm tropical waters. So they are found in those uh, parts of the world where they're um, subtropical, tropical, um, and uh, other warm coastal waters. So for the manta rays, this kind of hatched pattern represents where in the world we'll, we can find them. Um, so for this particular species of manta that I'm focusing on, the reef manta ray, we see them mostly in the Indian Ocean um, and areas around um, Indonesia uh, and the Philippines um, and Australia, uh, and also in the Pacific Ocean um, in places like Hawaii. Okay, so what I've done here is I have overlaid the, uh, the habitat of the reef manta rays with where we find plastic pollution. So the darker the red color, the more plastic pollution we're finding um, in these uh, specific areas. So you can see that the habitat range of manta rays does overlap quite a bit with parts of the ocean that are polluted in plastic. Okay, so here is the habitat range for the whale sharks. Again, they like those equatorial warm uh, tropical waters, um, but can also get a little bit further north and south and take advantage of warm ocean currents. And again, if we see um, the map of the plastic pollution, uh, we can see that their habitat range does overlap in quite a few areas uh, where we have uh, lots of plastic. So, um, the bad news is that um, in 2015, we estimated that an 8 million metric tons of plastic entered the ocean. This was done by uh, a, a lady by the name of Jenna Jembeck um, and uh, a big global study. 
So what happens with that plastic when it enters the ocean? Well, oceans are um, complicated environments. Um, they're uh, impacted uh, by a variety of things, including um, wind, um, which creates currents, um, and as well as the, um, even the turn of the, of, the, of the planet, of the Earth. Um, so you might notice that some areas are much darker red uh, or orange than others. Um, so places like the Mediterranean Sea, and that's because um, there's very little uh, outflow from this area. So we call this a, sem call this a semi-enclosed basin, meaning that there's very little exchange with the out with outside oceans. Other places similar are the Gulf of Mexico. But what about these places right out in the, uh, in the middle of the oceans? Well, we have these, um, five large rotating currents that we call the oceanic gyres. And there's one in the North Pacific, in the South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. And these currents serve to concentrate floating um, items um, and um, things like plastic, which does float very well in water, uh, tend to concentrate in these areas, and which is why you start to see some parts of the world have much more uh, plastic particles than others. Um, and another study estimated that there's currently about 5 trillion pieces of plastic um, that are floating around in our ocean. And this is just a photo taken um, from one of the places where I do my research. So I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's talk a little bit about plastics and more specifically microplastics. Um, so scientists have devised um, a uh, a classification system um, that classifies uh, plastic that we find in the marine environment according to their size. Um, so you might have already been quite familiar with the term microplastic, I've heard it before. And what microplastic is, is plastic particles that range from about one micrometer in size to about five millimeters in size. And five millimeters is about the, the size of your pencil eraser. So something a bit, something uh, from that size and smaller. So while we can see uh, some of these plastics with the naked eye, so here's a photo uh, taken down a microscope and you can see um, the uh, a photo of a ruler and then the smallest size here, this is actually one millimeter and these jagged little pieces are the microplastics um, and these little um, creatures here are actually the copepods. So you can see um, that microplastics overlap quite nicely with the size um, of, um, of plankton, some of the things that the uh, filter feeders are going for, for their food. So that's our microplastics. Now, when I'm um, talking about my study results, which will come up, I just want you to keep in mind that I'm actually gonna be looking at um, plastics that are slightly larger um, the microplastics, so pieces up to about 20 millimeters or 20 centimeters in size, um, and down to about 100 microns. And that's because that's the size of my, um, the mesh that I sample with, that's the size of uh, the mesh, which means that anything smaller than uh, 100 micron, sorry, um, uh, 0.1 millimeters um, uh, will be able to uh, escape through the mesh openings. Okay, so why are we so concerned about plastic um, and uh, it, it in the environment? Well, uh, as plastic spends time in the marine environment, it actually breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, um, hence these microplastics. Um, and as it degrades from UV exposure from the sun and just from mechanical damage from the waves, um, wave action and from, um, you know, uh, uh, other uh, mechanisms like that, um, it gets really good at picking up any form of pollutants that might also be floating around in the marine environment. So it becomes very porous, almost like a sponge, where all these uh, pollutants that are um, like pesticides and other chemicals from industries um, can uh, latch on really nicely. As well, plastics often have um, some chemicals added to them um, to make them, for example, more softer, more pliable, um, and also resistant to uh, fire, which is a good thing. Um, but some of these chemicals are also quite toxic if they end up inside um, organisms. So this is what we're concerned about as plastic um, in the marine environment, especially the small plastics can resemble uh, the food of uh, many different types of fish. And um, because 
once a small fish uh, eats some of this plastic um, and then uh, any other fish that might prey upon that smaller fish uh, will then also ingest this plastic and we call this bioaccumulation as plastic starts to build up into the into the food chain um, and might even end up on our dinner plates um, some studies are now showing that people um, are um, on average ingesting about a credit card full of plastics um, a credit card size uh, amount of plastic um, every week. Um, and some of that plastic might be coming in from um, sources like seafood. Now for the filter feeders, they feed very low in the food uh, web. So they're likely to have less of this bioaccumulation issue, but because they have to feed on such a large amount of plankton in order to meet this, the demands of a large animal such as they are, um, so mantis, for example, getting up to about eight meters in size and whale sharks well over 10, um, then they need to eat quite a lot. Then we worry that some of the water that they are filtering might be tainted with plastics and in some of these chemicals, which we know are toxic um, and may have um, impacts on their ability to reproduce and grow and be fit. So um, some other things that uh, worry us is that there are estimations that by the year 2050, um, just under 30 years away, there might actually be more plastic in the sea than fish. And we already are seeing the impact of plastic on marine life. We know that 90% of seabirds um, inject plastic um, and um, leads to mortality of their uh, newborns called fledglings. Between 18 to 30% of commercially available fish stocks um, have uh, plastic in their digestive systems. All seven out of seven uh, marine sea turtles are impacted by plastic. And for me, one alarming fact is that zooplankton, the very uh, same stuff that filter feeders, um, but many other creatures as well, basically the basis of our food chains are also ingesting the smallest pieces of plastic. And that's what you see here lit up by this green color. And in some parts of the world, for example, on uh, the North Pacific gyre, plankton, out, uh, sorry, plastic actually outnumbers plankton six to one. Um, so we now know that over 600 marine species are harmed by plastic marine debris, and that number keeps growing. Um, and 17% of these are listed, listed as threatened or near threatened on the um, IUCN red list, which is our list of species and how they are faring. So uh, manta rays and whale sharks, unfortunately, are also included on this, um, with manta rays um, being vulnerable um, and whale sharks being endangered. So I was motivated at the start of my studies to find areas where I can really study this problem. So I held out, I, I, on the advice of friends, I, had, I went out to a place um, in Indonesia off the popular tourist island of Bali to have a look at um, the type of things I might be finding floating in the water. So I took my mask and snorkel and I headed down and, um, on a little boat trip and jumped into the water and right away, uh, without even a microscope, I could see that there was quite a bit of plastic uh, floating around the surface, quite big pieces. Um, and the thing that uh, made this uh, place stand out as a good location to study uh, the potential impacts of plastic to mantis is this exact same location where the plastic was concentrating along with natural debris was the same, very same location where you see manta rays feeding as you can see in this video here. So uh, very briefly, you can see all sorts of items in there from packages to straws, um, and here are some scuba divers who are also here to observe the mantas as they circle around and feed. So here you see a straw and a plastic bag and a bottle cap, bottle cap um, and things like that floating around um, along with um, the plankton that the mantas are trying to feed on. A. So, um, and then uh, from the very same location, a friend of mine took this photo and sent it to me and said, hey, you really should come and study uh, plastic pollution here because this is a good place um, to see what happens.
So I did, uh, but I also wanted to do some comparisons to some other locations uh, where I know manta rays and whale sharks um, congregate to feed. So uh, my three locations were at whale shark feeding ground on the island of Java, um, this location that we just saw in the video um, just off the south of Bali, uh, and another um, manta ray uh, location within the Komodo National Park, which are all uh, within Indonesia. All right, um, so first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to catalog how much plastic was floating on the surface. And we did this um, through visual surveys. Now, obviously with visual surveys, we can only see the kind of larger pieces of plastic, but it still gave us a pretty good indicator of what uh, we might be finding below. So we did visual surveys, um, but we also st uh, stuck a plankton net. Um, so this is when I was talking about the mesh of the net. This is what I was talking about. Um, we also stuck a plankton net in the water, which is equipped with a device which is able to measure the amount of volume of water that filters through. Um, and then we collected some samples that way. Uh, and I also had a much smaller net that I could jump in the water with um, so I can get a little bit closer to the animals without disturbing them with our boat uh, and collect some, um, some water directly from where, nearby where they're feeding to have a look at the plastic and the plankton that's mixed in. And we took this back to lab um, and a pretty rudimentary microscope and did some analyses. Uh, I've got one of my volunteers here who's helping me um, as I'm counting and measuring the types of plastic. And here's uh, an example of the view down my microscope, the type of things that I was seeing. And this is just a regular ruler. Um, and we also wanted to compare if there was any differences between the two main seasons in Indonesia. So there we basically just have two seasons. One has a lot of rain, so we call it the rainy season, and one that doesn't have a lot of rain, so we call that the dry season. We wanted to see if there was an impact um, on the, um, uh, the rain on uh, the amount of plastic that we might see there. Um, so here's a couple of little photos of our team out in the field. So we have students joining in from the local university um, that come in um, and um, yeah, it's also quite a lot of fun uh, for them to get some field experience. So what we did find, um, unsurprisingly, is that during the rainy season, we see a lot more plastic. Um, in Bali, it was up to 28 times more than in the dry season. In Komodo, it was a bit more modest, um, but still about three and a half times more plastic in the rainy season than in the dry season. And here's a pretty famous, uh, a picture of a pretty famous video of a friend of mine who was um, swimming with manta rays and ended up swimming through a large uh, plastic trash um, slick um, that he uh, recorded very well. And it went pretty viral across the world a couple of years ago. So why are we getting more um, more plastic during the rainy season? Well, because about 80% um, of our plastic that we see in the ocean actually comes from land and rivers play a big role in this. Um, and uh, some studies are showing that uh, a number of the rivers that contribute the majority of plastic um, to our oceans are actually located uh, within um, the Southeast Asia region uh, in places like uh, India, China, uh, but also within Indonesia itself. So the larger the blue circle here, the larger the input of, of plastic from the river into the sea. So you can see uh, that we have quite a lot of rivers. And during the rainy season, these rivers swell. So any waste that might be distributed along the river bank which is a common place for a lot of places uh, within this part of the world to um, get rid of their waste, gets um, brought in um, towards the marine environment. So it's unsurprising that during the wet season we see more. Uh, and so here are some of the examples of the types of plastic that we're seeing. Um, so over 50% of the plastic was actually this kind of soft type plastic, plastic bags, wrappers, um, um, and another about 15% or so, depending on the location, was uh, a bit more of the harder type of plastic. So plastic bottles and um, uh, plastic cups, um, and also some everyday island items and treats like Kinder Eggs uh, were seen floating around uh, in these manta feeding sites. And this is just a little picture to show you that after we finish counting, we also try to clean up as much as we can um, that we see floating around. And yep, so here's another photo of one of our uh, volunteers, or one of the students from the university sampling some water uh, with the manta rays. So yeah, um, 
What we found as well with the uh, sampled plastic that we sampled with our net, so this is the much smaller types of plastic, um, is that it's very similarly, the majority of it is this kind of soft film type plastic, which will uh, come from the breakdown of wrappers and packaging and plastic bags. Um, and then uh, the next largest, larger kind of uh, de denomination or percentage of the type of plastic we saw were fragments of harder plastics. So think about bottle caps, uh, plastic cutlery like spoons, um, breakdown of plastic bottles and things like that. So one of my students wanted to dig a little bit deeper. This is Janice. Uh, and for her uh, final year project during her bachelor studies at university, she wanted to dig into what um, is the chemical makeup of the type of plastic that we see. And this is important because it helps us, uh, helps us identify uh, the sources of some of these tiny plastics that we much, might not really know where they come from. Um, and it gives us an idea of um, also the, t the potential um, for um, uh, toxic chemicals that each plastic um, pa plastic piece might be carrying as different uh, plastic polymers or, or, or types um, have different properties. So what she did is she uh, took a lot of the different plastic uh, samples that we have, mixed them all together and sorted out the plastic pieces that we found according to whether they were hard or soft, so fragments or films, um, or lines or foam like styrofoam. Um, and then she looked into color, whether they uh, were colored or transparent um, and whether they, um, uh, yeah, so and she broke them up into some different groups there. And then she took these different groupings and she ran it through um, a, a machine called an FTIR, which identifies um, the properties of the plastic and uh, identifies its chemical composition um, using um, uh, wavelengths of light. So each plastic basically has a different uh, picture um, that it emits later on. So what we found very briefly was that the majority of the plastic pieces that were of um, made of polyethylene. Um, and this is the same kind of stuff that we see in plastic bags, um, a lot of wrappers, um, a lot of single use uh, items. And the next most common one was pro polypropylene, which again is used in some single use items, for example, bottle caps uh, and a bit harder, sturdier things. Um, we also did see some polystyrene, um, so that's your, your foam stuff, and as well as a bit of polyester. But the main types were things that we would associate with household items in single use. Um, and what I was interested in knowing uh, was what, um, knowing that there is quite a bit of plastic floating around um, in uh, the areas where manta rays and whale sharks were feeding, knowing how much uh, water that they are uh, filtering per hour, how many pieces of plastic um, can we estimate that they might be ingesting in our feeding? And for manta rays, that was up to about 63 pieces of plastic per hour. And for whale sharks, it was over 100 pieces, so about 137 uh, plastic pieces per hour. So um, this goes beyond theoretics. Uh, so sorry. Um, so here's a, another picture of the types of plastic um, that we uh, might expect to find uh, in the marine environment that we took uh, some photos of, of our microscope, except for the difference is, is these uh, pieces here and that you see in this picture, you can even see a little writing on this piece, uh, were actually collected in a piece of manta ray poop. That's right. Um, we were lucky enough to collect um, some um, fecal samples or poop samples and have a look and see if we can confirm uh, plastic ingestion. And unfortunately we could. So this photo here is a microscopic image of, of the types of plastic we found in manta ray poop. And here is another image of um, some actually a manta ray vomit material. So this manta ray was feeding for a while um, and then had ingested some, I guess, large pieces of plastic which were not settling well. Um, and then that manta decided to cough up um, uh, the items that they had ingested. And from whale sharks, we also know from studies elsewhere, like in Brazil, um, from um, stranded whale sharks that have unfortunately uh, beached themselves um, and then uh, and then uh, passed, that uh, when we scientists look in and do some necropsies, basically having a look at what the cause of death is, um, we have found um, 
plastic items um, and actually these are much larger than microplastics even as you can see this is five centimeters here um, inside their um, inside their stomachs um, and in another place in the Philippines again we see different types of plastics but again plastic strings foam and plastic wrappers a soft type of plastic so while this does definitely um, concern us and is not good news um, that we are seeing that plastics are being ingested by the manta rays um, and there is quite a lot in their marine environment, um, we can actually um, hope that by raising awareness um, about this fact, we can um, uh, capitalize or um, basically uh, use the iconic status of these uh, gentle giants that are very popular with tourists um, and just inspire a lot of awe uh, in the general public um, to um, serve as great ambassadors um, for um, this plastic problem. So we call this a flagship species. And because these um, large animals need such large environments to live, if we work hard to ensure that their habitats are clean and free from plastic, um, then and their protection will actually benefit entire ecosystems, other species, and the entire environment. Um, so these are really good animals to focus on um, in terms of ensuring that their habitats um, are, are, are clean of plastic and that they can have a healthy livelihood because it will um, have impacts on many other species as well. So you might be asking uh, what you can do um, in your everyday life um, to uh, be part of the solution. Well, one thing you can do is you can quit um, using single-use plastics and um, some really easy ones to give up are plastic shopping bags, plastic water bottles. You can always um, bring your own tumbler, uh, fill your water bottle um, and um, say no to plastic drinking straws um, and also other way, other takeaway containers. So bring your own container when you're getting takeaway, um, say no lid for your coffee or bring your keep cup um, and things like that or your, um, your soda pop. So try to drink uh, aluminum from aluminum cans that are recyclable rather than using plastic, uh, just some ideas. You can also get together with your friends and family or your class and go clean a beach or a riverbed. As we know, all rivers lead to the sea. Um, you can become a citizen scientist and help scientists monitor the marine environment. There's loads of great ideas out there on how to do um, surveys in your own backyard um, that could actually really help scientists monitor um, the state of our environment. Um, and importantly, you need to be able to enjoy nature. So get out there um, on your weekend and your evenings um, and go for a walk in the park um, because, um, you know, we are prioritize, we protect what we love. And I just wanted to just suggest one other thing that you might be uh, interested in doing potentially as a class is join um, the Constellation. This is our new membership service um, with the Marine Megafauna Foundation where you can get behind the scenes um, interviews with scientists and lots of information about the studies that we're doing on manta rays, whale sharks, but many other species as well, um, many other species of sharks and rays, turtles, you name it. So that's just a little suggestion. You can go to our website at marinemegafauna.org. So I just wanted to thank all the people that were involved uh, in making this study um, and um, the supporters that made it happen. And um, yeah, so you can follow more uh, about us on Facebook and Instagram at Microplastics and Megafauna. All right. Well, Ellie, thank you so much for that great presentation. Uh, you know, it's really kind of scary to think about some of those statistics that, you know, not too far in the distant future, think of how large our ocean is, that there could be more plastics in our ocean than, than fish. That's, uh, that's a startling statistic and, and more reason than ever that we need to turn that tap off and, and stop that flow of plastic into our ocean. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, we're going to do a little Q&A in just a moment, but first we're going to do our Kahoot quiz. So uh, I'm going to pop a link here up on the screen. So there it is. That's the link. It'll take you to a spot where you can put in a pin code, which I'm going to share in just a moment. Um, if you're in the classroom, there's two ways to take part. You could do it just as a big group and shout out your answers to the teacher at the front. Uh, or if you're lucky enough to have a, a computer in front of you, a Chromebook or um, a tablet, and you can join one-to-one. -one. But here we go. Bear with me while I share my screen. 
and then we'll get things going. So entire screen. All right, let's fire up this Kahoot. So just to remind everybody the way that this is going to work. There we go. So the pin should load, sh or should load up shortly. Let's see. There we go. 931088. 931088. We'll give a couple minutes to see, or a minute or so to see how many players are able to join us. But um, 20 seconds for each question. We'll see how well you are paying attention during the presentation. Um, the correct answer, of course, you get points. Uh, mm. As well, the quicker you can answer that question, the more points you're going to get. So speed is important, but speed means nothing if the answer is incorrect. So we'll give another maybe 30 seconds. I can see students joining us. That's great. So Ali, we will see how well they are paying attention to that Manta action and microplastics. And we'll see who comes out on top. Great group of students joining us. All right, well, the first question is going to launch right now. Although names keep popping in, so maybe 10 more seconds. Wow, almost 100. It's going to be a busy quiz. All right, here we go. Hitting start now. Let's see what happens. So question one, what do filter feeding animals generally feed on? Was it seagrass, plankton, sea jellies, or corals? You've got about 10 seconds to get that answer in. Seagrass, plankton, sea jellies, or coral. All right, well, it looks like even though it's early, they were paying attention, 75 students went with plankton. Uh, and let's see who's holding down the leaderboard at the moment, Leo. Good job, Leo. Next question coming up at you right now. Scientists generally consider microplastics to be how small? Less than five millimeters, less than 10 millimeters, less than one micron, or 1,000 microns? So that's a bit of a tricky one. Lots of numbers coming at you. Another way to think of it was size of a pencil eraser, size of your fingernail bed, invisible to the naked eye. Wow, good job. 59 went with less than five millimeters to the size of a pencil eraser. Good job. And the leaderboard stays the same, Leo up on top. Question three, what are the most common types of plastics found floating on the surface uh, in the sampled Indonesian waters? Was it hard fragments? Was it soft particles, foam balls, or fish lines? So lines from fishing reel or long lines. Hard fragments, soft particles, foam balls, or fish lines. All right, good job. 76 went with soft particles. A shift to Madame Archer's grade seven and eight class, who we'll see shortly for some questions. They've taken the lead, but anything can happen with our final question. It's a bit of a tricky one. Was there a seasonal difference in the amount of plastic Ellie found in her Indonesian study sites? No but differences in locations? No, no differences between the locations. Yes, but only one site, or yes, both study sites. So was there a seasonal difference? So. All right, couldn't fool the majority. 58 went with yes, both uh, of the study sites. Let's see how we shake out. Liam and Ben holding down third. I love the earth. All right, second place. Oh, Madame Archer seven and eight holding down the top spot. Thanks everybody for taking part in the quiz. Uh, let's roll on to a little bit of uh, Q&A action now. So I'm just gonna stop my screen share here. All right, uh, so those tuning in via YouTube, of course you can use um, that spot to send in your uh, questions. And I'm gonna bring Madame Archer's class in first. I could see them celebrating their victory there. Uh, Madame Archer, how are we doing? Congratulations. All right, well, we'd love to grab a question from you. So grade seven, eight class joining us. 
And I think you're on mute right now. I can't, uh, there we go. No, not yet. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you guys have a quick question for us? Do you guys, anybody have a quick question? Pardon? <laughs> they were all writing on sticky notes, but um, I think we got really excited about the poot there that uh, we didn't. I think we're all just running on excitement right now, but we learned a lot. <laughs> That's okay. Oh. Shoot me a message in the chat if you want me to come back to your group. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, we're about <laughs> Okay. <Pardon>? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna tuck them backstage. Maybe we'll see a question pop in via the live chat. We've got a grade 10 science crew joining us. I'm gonna bring them in here right now. How are we doing, everyone? All right. Do we have a quick question for Ellie? All right, Adam, you yes. want to ask a question? I have a question. Can you hear me? We gotcha. Yeah. Is there anything being done to um, get rid of the plastics? like safely and without detriment to the environment? Uh, yes, there are a few different things happening um, in the places where I'm working and I'm sure there's things happening uh, around where you are. But um, as of 2018, Bali actually banned a lot of the single use plastic items um, that were most problematic, um, like shopping bags and takeaway containers and plastic straws. Um, there's obviously still more that needs to be done because there's a lot of packaging um, that you can't avoid uh, that's still ending up. So better management of the waste that's created is definitely needed as well. Um, and uh, we're also seeing uh, a number of um, kind of uh, floating barriers being put in in uh, some of the more problematic rivers um, that just float near the surface so that fish life and things can still float through. Um, but because the majority of the plastic um, initially when it starts from um, from upriver, it floats, um, then they start to collect these uh, barriers, collect up the plastic, so then people can come and clean them out periodically. It's still better if we never had as much to begin with, but at least not as much as making its way to the ocean, where it's much harder to clean up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the best analogy that I've heard is the bathtub. If your bathtub was overflowing, uh, would you just mop the floor while it was overflowing, or would you turn off the tap? So number one, we got to turn off that tap, get that plastic to stop flowing in and then we can think about how can we remove uh some of it very cool all right uh let's go to louisiana i know we've got uh, a crew with mr dupuy joining us let's bring them in there they are yeah! great right. how are you doing st thomas all right this is mr dupuy's class uh we are eco warriors okay all right so our question is how can we find out how much plastic is in the gulf of mexico compared to other oceans that's a great question. Um, and actually, um, there was a study that looked into it not that long ago. Um, and I actually, in my paper, I did compare it uh, off by, uh, but I don't know it off by heart, but I can send you guys a link with that uh, comparison straight away. But I got to tell you, it's the Gulf of Mexico is one of the places that had high levels of plastic, if not one of the highest at the oh. time of the study. Oh, I'm no. just trying to find that paper now and see if I can tell you exactly, because there's a little chart that I um, I put together just so that people can compare this kind of stuff easily. Uh, while you look for the paper, I'm gonna also recommend, yesterday we hosted someone from the app Debris Tracker, uh, mm. which is an app that you can use to you know go out and, and track debris that you find uh, in the local community. And then there's a big database there. So you can probably find some good information about uh, the debris that are being found in the Gulf of Mexico as well. If you check out the Debris Tracker app uh, and then right on the website, they've got a nice collection of the data. So that's another spot they can check out as well. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll give you a, uh, another moment, Ellie, if you're able to find that study. Otherwise, I can send it to the class afterwards. Yeah, I, I've oh. just been um, just looking through which of the papers it was in. But I have a feeling that it might have actually was probably in an earlier draft of the paper. I didn't actually make it in. But I, yeah. I can I can get that info for you guys. Yeah. No problem. Perfect. If you can track it down, I'll send it to uh, our Eagle Warriors. 
Uh, let's head to Mexico now. Uh, Ms. Andrew's class is joining us. They're a hybrid group, so some are in the classroom, some are at home. How are we doing today? Hi. Fine, and here I have a student who has a question in Santiago. Um, well, I'm going to ask you that what is the thing that most you like from being biologist? And what is your experience more awesome or cooler or whatever? Okay. Um, so the first question is what it's like to be a marine biologist? Yeah, what do you yeah. love about it? What do you like about it? Well, obviously, um, I love spending time in the marine environment with the animals um, that I'm most interested in. So before I did a lot of um, science in a lab, which is also really exciting as well. Um, you get to, um, you know, look through a microscope and mix different uh, solutions together to make really cool stuff happen. But witnessing animals in their natural environment and just being part of their world, even just for a little bit of time, is really what what most marine biologists are driven by. Um, because unfortunately, we see a lot of things these days that need to be helped and fixed. Um, so it does give us a boost of energy um, when we're in a natural environment with the animals and it inspires us to keep working. And then Santiago, what was the second part of your question? The coolest thing? It was like, what is the experience that most you like or your awesome experience or the experience that you think that it is the better experience? Yeah. Um, gosh. Well, I think the one that really got me in, in uh, interested in studying manta rays is I had an opportunity to swim with them in the Komodo National Park, which is one of my favorite places um, to study, um, where I had about 100 mantas. And these are big animals, like we're talking five meters across, um, swimming together and feeding. Um, and they were just everywhere. And they were just really not shy at all and just didn't really mind that there was this human in in the middle um of their of their soup and they were just swimming all around me and um yeah i think that was when i was motivated to start um researching how to better protect these animals all right well that sounds phenomenal i'd love to be in the water surrounded by a hundred mantas that sounds like a pretty special experience and Tough to find another one that can top that. Yeah, well, early on I had it and I haven't had it again. So I didn't realize until later just how special it was. Yeah. All right, Madame Roberts crew, hanging out with us in Georgetown. How are we doing today? We're great, we're great. That was an awesome presentation and we have a few questions. So I am going to ask the first one because I know how busy and how, how many people are in attendance. So is there hope that our oceans and water systems could be cleaned up? And what do you think needs to happen? Yes, um, I definitely think that there is hope. I mean, we've had other large um, global challenges that we've tackled successfully, um, you know, getting rid of uh, chemicals that cause a hole in the ozone layer, for example. Um, but what's gonna actually take is a concerted effort um, and I see a lot of individuals jumping on board and that's fantastic, but we're going to need to also have uh, it come down from governments um, and also companies. So even just this morning, I was reading the news and I was seeing um, that a few uh, parts of the US and in Canada are shifting their responsibility uh, from people having to recycle to the companies that are actually making the, the goods and making them come up with um, systems for recycling or even paying for that. Um, and what that does is actually incentivizes these companies to make items that are more easily recyclable or use less packaging to begin with. And that's called uh, extender, extended producer responsibility. And I think, I think we need to have a lot more of that. Although it's great to have individual action in order to really have what we need is we need that approach from from also from top down, um, as we did with the chemicals um, that were harmful to the ozone layer. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, that's uh, some great strategies. It's great to see more bans happening in different places, ranging from straws to plastic bags to single use cutlery. Uh, and then, you know, I always love the, the kind of talking with your wallet. So buying products that are made out of recycled goods or that don't come with excessive packaging 
And I think you'll see companies pretty quickly uh, make some changes if, if, if we made a few more choices with our wallets too, our consumer power. I agree. All right. Uh, great. Our grade seven and eight crew, our quiz masters, they have come through with a question here in the chat. Uh, and they're wondering, do you have a favorite location, uh, study location? And then have you had an encounter with a whale shark? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I really love the Komodo National Park. Um, it's famous for the Komodo dragon, the world's largest lizard. Uh, but the marine environment there is just spectacular. Very vibrant corals, lots of great currents that bring in lots of food. So you can have really great encounters there with the mantas. Um, whale sharks come through there. Whales come through there, like the blue whale, the world's largest whale. Uh, I've had the pleasure of seeing there. Uh, other interesting animals like dugongs, which are like sea cows, eat the seagrass, lots of turtles. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, you know, uh, got everything for everybody there. So uh, it's a very special place. And yes, I have seen a whale shark. Um, I've seen a whale shark a couple of times in um, uh, Java where we were doing our um, our research on, um, on, the, on the microplastics, but also in the Philippines. Um, yeah, so mostly in Indonesia and the Philippines. I've got a great photo of the whale sharks that we saw in the place in Java. Unfortunately, the visibility in the water was so poor that we couldn't see them from the water, but we could see them from the boat. And I've got this photo of this whale shark in this like green pea suit that I can um, uh, send on to Joe if you wanted to uh, share it. There we go. Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Definitely I can share that with the classrooms afterwards. Whale sharks are, well, I mean, what's not to love world's biggest fish they can be as big as a school bus uh pretty darn cool um yeah definitely send that photo along uh and then ellie i'm trying to recall our last conversation are you heading into the field soon yes um actually next week we're flying back to indonesia um after a bit of a visit with family since we were um you know couldn't get here for a while but yeah we'll be flying back next week um, and I've got a student now who's doing some really interesting research on uh, manta ray reproduction. So mm -hmm. she's trying to figure out how many mantas are getting pregnant every year, how many babies are being born, um, because mantas are actually uh, have very few, very few babies. Um, they only give birth to one baby at a time, and it takes them 12 months to gestate the baby, so longer than even humans. Um, so they're very conservative, in, is what we say, in their um, reproductive history. So we want to learn a bit more uh, in hopes of figuring out how long it will take to bounce back populations. All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube crew. Thanks for tuning in uh, today, playing Kahoot along with us. Of course, a big shout out to our camera classrooms. Thanks for the great questions and spending your morning with us. Uh, and Ellie, thank you so much for the work and the research you're doing. Thank you for sharing that story with us, what's happening to our, our amazing marine megafauna, our large filter feeders. Uh, and we're excited for you to get back in the field and maybe an update. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, let me pop our crew in here in case they want to give a big wave, a big goodbye. There they are. Send right. through that stuff to you, Joe. Joining us today. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see your faces. All right, we are going to sign off for today. Don't forget, we have a ton more events coming up this week and next. And then we'll release all our October events. And we'll do 50 or 60 more events, because why not? Thanks so much for joining us, everybody.